Okay, so I'm the oldest of three boys. Yeah, I am the only girl and the oldest girl. So cue the applause for my making it this far. Thank you, thank you. When you're the oldest of that many boys, you start to get really good at listening. I mean, scary good. There was one time, a couple years ago, I was doing the dishes after making a meal for my brothers. They were in the other room, out of eyesight, and I'm a loud person, so I had no problem yelling at them to have a conversation. I was talking to the oldest one, when I could tell he wasn't listening to me. His responses were almost right, but by the slight lack of inflection in his voice, the length of pauses between each response, and most importantly, he wasn't laughing at all of my jokes. I could tell that he was texting someone and who it was. So I did the big sister thing. Snuck into his room when no one was looking, scared the crap out of him. <laughs> Being a big sister rocks sometimes, 10 out of 10. Sometimes, in just a glance, I can tell where my brother's hearts and souls are at. Pretty freaky, right? My brothers think so, too. Needless to say, I have a bit of a knack for listening. For me, it's an art, a skill, really. I think that people underestimate the difficulty and the power of listening. I've been working towards the aim of racial justice for years now, working with black student organizations and presently serving as the co-chair for the reparations committee. Some of our most influential anti-racist thought leaders have spent hours upon hours engaging with the voices of these marginalized communities listening for the patterns, the themes, the core issues. One of my biggest responsibilities as co-chair is actively listening to the voice of these communities in order to make decisions that support their feedback. If I wasn't doing this, my recommendations would be off, my direction misguided, and my work unrepresentative of the people that I wish to serve. Listening is crucial. Now more than ever. I've probably heard the phrase, listen to black people a thousand times over. I've gotten 300 messages from folks, been in dozens of awkward Zoom conversations and fielded way too many uncomfortable questions. And yet, I didn't feel listened to. As I grieved another loss of life, no one was listening to me. It doesn't take an expert to know what George Floyd needed in those eight minutes and 46 seconds as he was murdered. He needed air, he needed compassion. He needed to breathe. Yet he was muffled, ignored, and silenced. I'm from Minnesota, and seeing what could have been my brothers denied their humanity shakes me to my core. There have been so many like George Floyd, and yet this summer, when people would try to listen to me, they didn't know what to say or do. I saw people who had never even considered the Black Lives Matter movement attempting to become anti-racist themselves, to become activists overnight. And this meant, while they could parrot certain lines, they didn't know how to listen to the voices of these movements, and that is a huge problem, but I may be able to help at least with the listening part. So I'm going to tell you three real stories that happened to me or my friends, and in them, I'll tell you my reactions to them and how each situation teaches us how to be better listeners, better learners, and better people 
on the road to anti-racism. There will also be some audience participation, so we'll see how that goes. When George Floyd was murdered, I got a text from someone that read, I can't believe this could happen. I'm so sorry. I responded by simply restating the, my gratitude, saying thank you. Then they said again, I don't even recognize America anymore. I gave them another thank you. And then the conversation ended. How would you rate this out of 10? Hands, I'm seeing a three, okay, an eight, six, two. I would give this a four. Here's what, here's what I heard. To avoid exposing this individual, we'll call them the cave person. The cave person's interactions are fairly typical to racial injustice. While typical, they are not necessarily productive. When the first thing that I see and read is I, it quickly moves the conversation into the world of that person, not me. And then when their follow-up was more surprise, I'll be honest, I got angry. I got angry because there is no reason to be surprised and shocked by the level of violence wrought against black people. I got angry because while I grieved every single loss of life, the cave person got to ignore it. And now society wrongly expects me to get them up to speed, to grab them from the stone ages and tell them that it's okay that this wasn't on their radar. Well, if instances of violence against black people, against marginalized communities still shock you, ask yourself why. How could something that affects millions of people every day not be on your radar? This conversation also put me in a difficult position. I would have loved to be at the center of the conversation, to be asked how I felt, how they could support me, or in many ways, and in many cases, just giving me some space. Unfortunately, the burden on black people, especially black women, is to grieve losses of life while simultaneously nurturing the ego of those just getting back up to speed. Then there was a conversation I moderated around racial injustice last year, and I'll be honest, I loved it, it was great. People were being vulnerable, they were asking questions, and while they were uneasy, I could tell that they were genuinely interested in learning more about these issues. And that was so great for me to hear and see. But an odd and not new habit sprung up among the participants. Before they would say a question or a comment, they would always start out with something like, I just finished this MLK memoir, or I just watched that, the documentary, The 13th, or I was having a conversation with a really close friend who happens to be African American. It was like approaching the entryway of my house wearing a hazmat suit. I was so confused. What I witnessed is what I like to call the resume dropper. The resume dropper is an individual who hopes to shield themselves in conversations or in racial justice by talking about the good things that they've done or things that they've read. And listen, it's not a bad thing to share good books that you've read or cool stories that you want to tell. I mean, I'd hope not because that is literally what I'm doing right now. The problem lies more in the reason for it. For the resume dropper, one of their biggest insecurities and, and fears is that people will think that they don't care about these issues, that they'll be labeled as racist or not woke. But here's the thing. The people who learned the most in these conversations were the ones who paid the coat check and hung up their pride at the door. They were the ones who, when they brought up an article, wanted to get people's opinions on it. They were the ones who, when talking about a documentary, were pulling out the relevant themes, but for the resume dropper, they aren't out to enhance the learning experience of those around them, or at least it's not their primary goal. And in doing so, they don't get as much as they could. And that means, ironically, the resume dropper doesn't do the one thing 
that could help them in these kind of situations to avoid their fears. Just listen and learn. Finally, there is the most elusive type that I have encountered, one that I think everyone has fallen prey to, and that is the contortionist. The contortionist kind of goes like this. I'll be talking to a student or a professor, either at the college or elsewhere, and we are making some fantastic insights together. We are talking about redlining, policing, systemic oppression, academic scholars that they are, they bring insights and questions that absolutely blow me away. Yet something that they say, barely perceptible if you aren't listening for it, stops me. They'll say something like, what's happening to black people is atrocious and a consequence of systemic racism. Did you hear it? It is so nitpicky. But there's an avoidance of accountability. Racism is a consequence of systems, yes, but also of us. The contortionist will twist in ways to avoid any sort of culpability. But if you say live in the suburbs, think about who had to be displaced for you to be there. If you attend or teach at a higher ed institution, consider the lives lost the freedoms lost, laying down the brick that you complain about so much. Consequences and institutions of oppression are not theoretical, they are real. We are culpable, therefore we uphold them. Unfortunately, the contortionist is the most dangerous and the most prevalent of these types. The contortionist will twist and turn in any way to avoid any sort of responsibility, and in doing so they miss the point. Radical change cannot happen if we don't take accountability in our own personal lives. Unfortunately, the contortionist, if they don't want to say it, or if they don't know it, still values its own personal and professional goals above all else. In the end, they want the status quo. But again, ironically, the contortionist in twisting and turning in ways wholly unnatural, completely unsustainable, put more pain to itself than if it just stood up straight and faced the problem head on. Okay, so as the young people would say, I might have put some of y'all on blast. If you're seeing yourself in some of these tropes, recognize that and internalize the lessons from it. Don't be like the cave person. Decenter your own shock and surprise around instances of racial injustice. Focus on your own personal growth instead of being like the resume dropper and letting your insecurities get the best of you. And connect you and your behavior back to what you're learning instead of contorting in ways that avoid responsibility. Listening requires reflection, vulnerability, and active participation. If you aren't doing these things, then listening will be harder for you to develop. But once you've developed it, you'll be able to connect with your learning between different systems, participate in activism that is productive rather than symbolic, and hold yourself accountable in the first place. There have been hundreds of thousands of George Floyds, meaning there have been hundreds of thousands of black and brown and indigenous people who have been killed and made examples of. That isn't new. What is new is the focus on these issues. And while I didn't feel listened to last year, in some ways, I felt seen. And that's an important first step. But the second step, a harder step, is building the ability to effectively listen with an activist ear. And in the gravest, most serious of terms, the values and tenets of our democracy rely on the ability to do what has never been done in the history of America before. To really, really shut up 
and listen. Thank you.